Hmm.
sorry sir we are just waiting for a registrar now okay okay yes. no worries <laughs> Good evening, sir. Sir, register as entered. Ready, okay. ma'am? Good morning. Good morning, sir. Shall we start the program, sir? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay. I'm ready when you all are ready. You can start now, Nishat. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. A warm good evening to one and all present here. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on analytical spectrometry expertise, atomic optical. On behalf of Department of Chemistry, B.S. Abdul Rahman Crescent Institute of Science and Technology. In spite of the pandemic prevailing in the world, we are happy that you all have joined for us this webinar. To begin with, to begin with prayer, I request our second MSc student, Katija, to recite the Khirat. Assalamu alaikum all. Surah Fatiha, the opening. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغلوب عليهم ولا الضالين Amin. The translation. With the name of Allah, the most gracious, the ever merciful, all type of perfect and true praise belongs to Allah alone, the Lord of the worlds, the most gracious, the ever merciful, master of the day of requital. You alone do we worship and you alone do we implore for help. Lead us on the exact right path till we reach the goal. The path of those on whom you have bestowed your blessings, those who have not incurred your displeasure, and those who have not gone astray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Katija. Now I invite Dr. Yes Kutirani, ma'am, Dean of School of Physical and Chemical Sciences, to give welcome address. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, you are audible, ma'am. Uh, very good evening to one and all present here. On behalf of Chemistry Department of B.S. Abdurrahman Crescent Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, I am happy to welcome you all for this webinar on analytical spectrometry organized by Chemistry Department of BSA Institute on 7th August 2021. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our Honorable Registrar of BSA Crescent Institute of Science and Technology, Dr. Asad sir, who has been kind enough to accept our invitation. I welcome you, sir. I am very happy to welcome our resource person of today's webinar, Dr. Ben Johns, Director, CTO Spectrum from America, who is going to deliver a talk on analytical spectrometry. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation. I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Ishwara Murthy, HOD Chemistry, Dr. Revati Purushottaman, Associate Professor, Chemistry Department, and also the coordinator of this webinar, my dear colleagues, and all the participants from all parts of India and other country participants, such as um, UK, USA, Spain, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. I take this opportunity to appreciate the efforts taken by Dr. Revati in organizing this webinar. With these few words, I once again welcome you all to this webinar. Thank you all. 
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for addressing the gathering. Now I request Dr. D. Ishwaramuthi, sir, head of the Department of Chemistry, to share few words about our department. Nisha, am I audible? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Good evening to one and all. Respect our registrar, respect our chief guest, and my dear uh, Dean School of Physical and Chemical Sciences, and my dear colleagues and participants. It's my pleasure to give over the department, salient features of our department. The department came to light in 2006 when it was recognized as Research and Development Center by Anna University when we are affiliated to Anna University to enroll research scholars for PhD program. The department started independent PhD program in 2009 and master's program in chemistry from the year 2010 when it became deemed to be university by University Grants Commission. It also caters to the needs of undergraduate programs of science, engineering, and technology of this institute. The department has 15 faculty members and all are doctorate in chemistry. Six of them qualified GSAR net examination. Eight of them have overseas experience as their postdoctoral fellows in countries like United States of America, Switzerland, France, Germany, Portugal, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Saudi Arabia. Two of our faculty members have industrial exposure and three of them have rich experience in teaching for more than three decades. The, the four faculty members have received a visiting fellowship by Indian National Science Academy. Eight of our faculty members are reviewers of international reputed journals of American Chemical Society, Elsevier, Springer, Royal Society of Chemistry, Taylor and Francis. And our faculty members are doing research work in the upcoming areas like organic synthesis, catalysis, materials and their application studies, the environment and corrosion studies. Till now, we have published 170 papers in, the, in journals of international repute with impact factor more than 10 such as Green Chemistry, Journal of Hazardous Material and also like very good journals like Journal of Organic Chemistry, Actuators and Sensor, Physical Chemistry and Chemical Physics, etc. And as of now, the H index of the department is 25 and total citation is 1,900. 11 faculty members have obtained projects from various funding agencies of India and executed successfully the project for top 2.5 crores. 11 research scholars have obtained a junior research fellowship from sponsor research project as well as from our institute. Two research scholars have obtained a direct SRF from CSIR. So far, the department has produced 20 PhD and 10 research scholars have already submitted a thesis waiting for their viva. We have international collaboration with Melbourne University, Australia, University of Mara, Malaysia, King Fagat University of Petroleum Minerals, Saudi Arabia, and national collaboration with the CSIR Central Electrochemical Research Institute, Karaikuri, Tamil Nadu, and Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced and Scientific Research, Bangalore. We have the sophisticated instrumentation facilities such as FTIR spectrophotometer, UV visible spectrophotometer, fluorescent spectrophotometer, gas chromatograph, HPLC, polarimeter, tensile tester, and TRS UV spin coder. All our instruments are working condition, and all our PG students, research scholars are trained to use that equipment. And today's webinar is on analytical spectrometry. As you know very well, which analytical is very, very important nowadays. And he will, the resource person is will discussing about both optical and atomic method and his commitment. Now the time is six o'clock in America. He's, that shows his commitment. And I, once again, I welcome you all for that webinar. Thank you, sir. Now I request our registrar, Dr. A. Azad, sir, to give the felicitation. Good evening to all of you. Uh, respected chief guest of uh, today's program, uh, Dr. Ben Johns, Director CTO, Spectrum America. Uh, Dr. Kutirani, Dean, School of Physical Sci and Chemical Sciences. Dr. Ishwaramuthi, HOD Chemistry, other faculty members, uh, researchers, and my dear students. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to give this uh, uh, felicitation for uh, this wonderful program 
on analytical spectrometry uh, like in the inauguration you know chemistry uh, studies uh, you know the change of uh, uh, matter uh, and uh, at every stage of our life uh, we need the research uh, to provide us some solution to all the complex problem problems that we have uh, whether it is you know to create a, you know a green world whether you have to convert one form of energy into other uh, simpler solutions you know simpler solution to complex problems uh, all these things are given by chemistry whatever you make whatever you do ultimately there will be some invention from in chemistry that will lead to such huge changes um uh, we know uh, as uh, you know researchers and all that the role played by uh, the spectrometry uh, chemistry always deals with very very small uh, you know in dimension uh, matters you know in atoms molecules uh, small quantities which cannot be directly Uh, seen or observed so uh, many many changes in the matter they have to be observed uh, observed through uh, indirect means uh, using various kind of properties so the analytical spectrometry is one of such areas uh, you know we can do research uh, we can do changes we can also find what what is the change that has come but why the change happened how much the change happened it comes through uh, different methods like uh, analytical spectrometry uh, i sincerely believe that uh, today's presentation uh, and the speech by dr ben johns will be of real help to our students this also will give our students great enthusiasm uh, to learn new subjects and then do new things uh, today to solve many of the problems uh, of the world we need inventions and the chemistry is one of the most important areas uh, where invention inventions can happen and definitely the, if our students and researchers will continue with the you know great enthusiasm we can really uh, invent many things we can discover many things. so Uh, i wish this program great success thank you rupesh thank you sir now i request dr revathi purushottaman ma'am associate professor department of chemistry and the coordinator of this webinar to deliver the introduction about our speaker thank you ma'am ben johns has started his career in 1990 as a technical support engineer at siemens analytical for x ray spectroscopy where he worked for 2 years and continued at horiba for another 2 and a half years then he continued as an engineer at spectro analytical instruments gmbh for next 3 years till 1996 he then worked as a field service engineer at faro technology smx uh, laser tracker for another 2 years till 1998 He was serving as a customer support engineer at Hitachi between 1999 and 2001. He then shifted to Lekau where he served as an engineer in the field of spectroscopy and chromatography for 21 years till 2019. He and then he escalated as a director spectrometer expert at Spectrum America USA in 2019 and also working for HP Agilent Varian. with his long journey of 31 years in the field of spectroscopy and chromatography he is now with us to share his enormous and incredible expertise now i am delighted to call upon our eminent speaker to present on analytical spectrometry expertise atomic and optical now i hand over the session to you sir thank you um i'm signing in from another uh, computer can you um let me in as i okay i think you can do it sir it's okay. on all right thank you very much um good morning uh from our end uh, it is good evening there it is such a joy for us to 
to come together and uh, be together to have a webinar in such a fashion. I greet you all. At the same time, I'm very grateful. To, I extend my gratitude to Crescent Institute of organizing and hosting such an event very successfully and all the labor, hard work, coordination, all they all did a good job and I appreciate it. Atomic or optical spectroscopy, and it has been used in analytical world for different areas. That is our focus of this webinar. And as we are focusing on that, I do have some in, you know, uh, PowerPoints, the slides that I have made that I will be sharing, uh, which will be in uh, different modules actually. So um, uh, we will take break in between for, um, uh, for anything that, you know, this is a long, long session. So I, I try to uh, do the modules like 20 minute or 25 minute modules, and then we will go from there. Um, so uh, I don't want it to go too detail into the introductory part as um, we have heard um, from the faculty. So let us move into what we are here for uh, today. And um, let me share the screen for you all. If anybody has any difficulty in seeing or uh, listening or having any technical issues with the meeting, uh, please do contact the present staff for uh, those concerns and address. It's visible, sir. Uh, can you all? Okay, great. The screen is visible, sir. Uh, excellent. So we do have an objective and goal for this webinar session, which is being organized. So the objective and scope for uh, this webinar is for the attendees to get earn an in-depth understanding of the principles of analytical spectrometry through the path of subject matter expertise stream. That second portion is that I am, I'm focusing more on to pass on the expertise and the exposure that I have learned, earned through all these years working with the manufacturer of different, different diverse techniques in this area, in this subject matter of analytical spectrometry and also involving with thousands of professionals, researchers, scientific community, academia, and industry uh, professionals who utilize this tool for various applications. So uh, it, it is a different stream than the lectures that you have learned or uh, you have um, listened before. And also, this session, this webinar will prepare the attendee by providing an understanding of the fundamental process behind this spe specific spectroscopic anal analysis methods and the design of a spectroscopic instrumentation. We, I don't know much about the audience. Normally, when we do the, when we give a training session or when we conduct, uh, uh, or, you know, like speaking engagements, uh, we greet each other, we get to know the audience, the level and their expectation. But this webinar is not uh, so, so bear with us as we will be going to different levels of, uh, we will be starting from the basic and then we will cover advanced as far that we can today with a lot of time. Then also we will be covering the principles of light matter interaction. That is all the spectroscopy is all about. The yeah, methodology of selected spectrum, the instrumentation of these spectroscopic methods and factors that affect the quality of optical measurements. We, I, the take home content or the takeaway material or the output the attendee wanted to take is the ability to understand this spectrometry concept and apply that method in their own area of activity. Let us stay focused on that. This particular 
learning outcomes. I have decided, divided into four. One, you would be able to describe the scientific principles underlying the atomic optical measurements. Two, describing the operation of instrument components and those components are essential to make spectroscopic measurements. And it is vital to know, it is very important to know what, how it were functions, what it is, and uh, all those specifics of it. Three, design and evaluate spectroscopic method for specific chemical problems. Four, evaluate results of measurements in terms of signals, signal to noise ratio, the interferences, what are the different levels of interferences, all those needed to be addressed. And I hope to achieve all this within the time that we have left over. Module one. It's what is of analytical spectrometry or atomic optical spectrometry? You all know it. Some of you may not. What is the history or background of analytical spectrometry? The history goes all the way back to Sir Isaac Newton in 1665, discovered that white light is compo composed of multicolored spectrum. This refuted the theory that the prism added the color to the light, which was proposed by Roger, Roger Bacon in the 13th century. So <clears throat> the history goes all the way back there, but that is not enough for to design, to utilize that for the spectrometric analysis. So the light matter interaction is mostly involved in this. And there, will, there is an ele electron energy shift. You can, nowadays you have a lot of choices to learn this basics. I'm going to just to glance through and move on. Um, I'm not going to stay on these things to explain how these things are happening, but let us continue. Light matter interactions. The energy shift happens from the ground state, atom or ion. Uh, the, I intentionally put that in there because we will be covering both later on. So when you apply an excitation energy, there are many different kinds of uh, spectrometric analytical tool, which we will be covering some of those, most, uh, some of those later on. And all, so, you know, most of them are differing with the way that excitation energy is being included in that particular instrumentation. So when an excitation energy is being applied, the outer orbit electron <clears throat> will be changing its, it will be shifting. And when it returns back to its orbit, it emits a spectral light. So it is an, you know, it is a, it, that is how the spectral light is being obtained out of a specimen or a sample. Types of light matter atom interaction. In the atomic spectroscopy, there are many types, which we will will be covering and just glancing through what all are those. So the first one is atomic absorption atomic emission, atomic mass. All these are different, like I said, the way that things are configured. Excited state, the ground state, and how the sample is positioned, how we get the spectral light from the sample is how this is differing between these techniques. So this, the way that, uh, let me, go through a, another slide that I wanted to bring it here. I think it's in a different right here. See that uh, atomic spectroscopy, when you look at this, this right here, this slide that, you know, with the yellow background, the absorption, the sample is positioned so that the light is passing through the, through the sample and the absorption is being measured. In emission, we make the sample to emit the spectral light and the, in the reading and all the detection and all those are happening after that. In a mass, which is you, you, you know, used with a mass spectrometry, which is 
iron mass to iron mass to charge ratio. So we needed to ionize the to ionize to the sample to get the you know to get the the you know the signal that we needed to do the spectrometric analysis. So that is how it is uh, you know that we will we we have this different types of light matter or light you know versus atom interaction happening. So let's move on. The theory of operation detection. This is one of the examples. There are many. After the, you know, so once we, like I explained to you that whether it is absorption or emission or ionization, once that signal is being received, strategically placed detectors are arranged to read, to collect, to process the, that signal. And that is what it is called a spectral device. These devices are the one which determines if it is an optical, it will be the wavelength or light or photon. If it is ionization, like I said, mass, mass numbers, which will be the fingerprint or the identifier, presence identifier of different elements, which we will be looking at the next slide, how that is being connected. And that, that spectral device provides us this fingerprinting process for our spectrometric and metric analysis. Element fingerprint. All elements can be qualitatively analyzed due to the fact that specific wavelength of light are associated with the different elements. If in case that we are using optical emission spectroscopy or atomic emission spectroscopy, these are the ranges the wavelength that I have listed here. For example, if you wanted to need, you know, read the gaseous element like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, then you needed to go to the, you know, the one of the faculty mentioned that we have a UV VIS uh, spectrometer in our in our uh, facility or in our university. So the, he was mentioning about a different techniques. Then he mentioned about gas chromatograph, HPLC. Uh, all those are used for various forms of sample handling, sample processing, and spectrometric analysis. Whenever a spectral device is being used to quantify the data of any sample or any, anything that we will be trying to detect or read or calculate or, or quantify quantitative or qualitative, with the help of a spectral device, it can be called spectrometry. The spectrometry, when I started in the late 89, 89 and early 90s, those were the days of analog meters. So this spectrometry existed then itself. And they were using a meter to read those. That is where the spectrometry came. Then you all know that oscilloscope and other a readout system has come out. So they have used, started using the spectroscope. That is where spectroscopy came. So all these are different terms, but same thing, spectrometry or spectroscopy, it is all the same. Uh, using spectral device, doing the calculation, collecting the spectral light, sending it over to a detection unit and reading it with the help of those days, it was the meter and analog readouts. Now we have, we are so fortunate to have the power of computing, which does a lot of calculations. This is the element uh, fingerprint that I explained here in a general generic scope uh, for different elements. Now it is for a specific element here for lead. You could see how the energy shift happens. And there are, you know, the NIST has compiled the lines or the, the spectral database. Anybody can access that. There is no, it is free for everyone. You, if you have online or access, uh, you can go to the NIST website uh, and you can access the lines which are element specific. 
So this transition happens and that, that energy shift are being recorded or we can use that as a library hit or you know database so that that you know against that we can um, we can use our computing calculation to have a peak identifier peak matching library hit for for all these uh, calculations and further processing for lead if we're taking this lead as an example the nist atomic spectral database list 205 emission lines in a small range of 167 nanometer to 785 nanometer range for lead. So then, you know, there are 200 plus lines there. And the NIST themselves did the study and provides us the data. What are the strongest line? What are the lines which are closer to each other than some spectral interferences happens along with another one. So th they have provided a lot of information for us to look into, pull those data. And that is a very much, very much of a major provision or for the advancement in this area of analytical spectrometry. For the, for the analytical information and the chemical calculations. So now you got an idea of you know, just an introduction, what, a, what is analytical spectrometry? Whenever a spectral device is being utilized, used for analysis, it could be anything. If you are in the material science world, you will be using a material. He mentioned uh, when the, the head of uh, department mentioned about the facility there at the engineering college, that he mentioned many techniques and also many industries. So if you are in the chemical uh, industry, or if you are in the research facility of doing tissue engineering, metabolism, or any of those areas, this, the, anything that you'd want to do an analysis using a spectral device, it falls into the category of analytical spectrometry. And that is, it is a very nice, you know, it's, it's a real beautiful and artistic and this is a very, very, very area of interest. Such a, such a nice area. And not only that, it is, it is very joyful to be learning more and more things every day basis, every time, every occasion. But all, you know, the sky is the limit. It, it, it has a lot of opportunities. It has lot, you know, it's, it has a, such a great future. If you are advancing your profession, those who are in that mode now that you wanted to secure a good promising professional future. This is one of the area that you can master into. There are a lot of different branches and we will look into some of those as we go along. This concludes the first module. You will be having only like one or two minutes. Uh, one, I, I know that this is a mass uh, uh, like a participant section. We don't have much time to do for the interaction sessions, like asking questions or you know, like anything. But if one wanted, one got lost, or I don't want you to be lost for the rest of the webinar. So if you really have a question, you can throw it at me, or and we have such a great uh, support system uh, with on this webinar. They can answer as well. So uh, like a couple of minutes. If not, you can get up wherever you are, uh, go for a walk and uh, have uh, it take a small small break uh, in for two minutes or three minutes.
Sir, is there any issue, sir? Uh, I'm, I'm switching over to uh, another PC. Okay, sir. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Dr. Pushottam? Yes. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I got tensed. Um, okay, good. Um, all right, let's go on to the module two. Technique. This is, I hope you all um, I, I know that I'm going little, little in a little fastest pace, but um, uh, that's all we could do. Uh, this, uh, um, you know, with this this kind of sessions that we needed to just to stay on the skin level, and so that we will be having, we can accomplish, attain what we planned to get this, what the lesson plan is for today. So the technique that I explained about the spectral device being used for analytical purpose, which we called, we titled analytical spectrometry, which includes to gather information, process information, calculate information, along with the chemical calculations. For so there are certain ways that we will be doing that and let us look one after the other on all these technique details. <clears throat> A sample, for example, you know, it, it goes from the, you know, the sample has been introduced to a, an excitation energy. Here in this case, it is a spark AES atomic emission spectrometer. An electrode will apply uh, the excitation energy over to the sample in a gap in under the inert gas. Uh, you could see that uh, that, that little, um, mark is being happened or the penetration or we, you know, that uh, little, um, you know, that uh, little, uh, you know, uh, sputtering 
happens into the surface. And then uh, the, you know, the light, the spectral light will be sent over to the engine of the spectral device, which you can see the wavelength the diffraction and detection happens. From there to the computer, then we will be getting the chemical calculations. So let us say that this was a small piece which had carbon, sulfur, phosphorus, silicon, manganese in the material science world of a foundry or a um, quality control check of aerospace or automotive. So they, they mount that onto the sample introductory system and to the instrument is fully automated nowadays um, with, um, uh, with that, those uh, power supply to be uh, that the sequence or recipe will load up and uh, that will do the analysis and you will get the that results in your way, fashion and unit that you desire in the screen. So that leads us for our wants and needs. So as, an, as a person involved in spectrometric chemical calculation, we needed to process the collected data to have it calculated to the unit and the way that we wanted that to be taken the output. So some of the optical components here are, you know, this uh, spectrometers and the wave optics. We know that wave optics, it starts with the microscope all the way even to a CD that you all used before the flash drive, the CD storage device. These all have diffraction. If you look in, you know, onto a CD on the bottom, you could see the rainbow on it. So that is diffraction that you are seeing. And at the same time, there are there were area the times that you could not read a CD, which which could have been that what is happening, diffraction not happening, some interference, some interruption, some something is not working. The same way this spectral device, see this instrument very in a very simple way don't complicate with all these words that you are hearing this is a very simple instrumentation technique used for analytical purpose so there are certain things that we needed to be aware of based on this see the detection system so the the first one section is the excitation energy we, we call it atomizer in atomic spectroscopy, we call it atomizer. And then the detection system, then the computer. So sampling, atomizer, detector, detection system, then the compute, computation. On the detection system, we have many light dispersion uh, process. So we will be, you know, we will be familiarizing, okay? With, we, will, we, we don't have enough time for to go into detail, but we will be familiarizing these technical terms and names of it, single slit, double slit, multi-slit diffractions. So um, uh, based on the detector that we, will be, we are using inside the instrument, uh, photomultiplier tubes, that photomultiplier tubes are mounted in such a way positioned um, I think one of the faculty has mentioned about their association and affiliation with the Karaikudi facility. Uh, and um, uh, that facility has come out with a photomultiplier tube based spectrometer decades ago in the, in the 30s or 40s, I guess. It is, it, there is a paper published by them. So that photomultiplier tube based design that they have the paper that they have published it they are from your own place your own place needed multiple slits there are then there are different versions of it with a single slit a double slit uh, like that so it all depends on the configuration and the layout and this architecture that we will be using uh, we don't, you know, we 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 can, we can have. Another, if anybody is interested to know more about these specific sessions, Dr. Purushottaman is very knowledgeable in the ICP that I have uh, seen her video and all that. Or you can reach out to me through the faculty there uh, for any of these things that uh, that we have gathered up a lot of information, putting our hands onto it. 
working with the monochromators, polychromators, spectrographs, all, all different kinds of uh, all the different kinds of instrumentation uh, to the component level. So we will be able to help you on that if one is needed. But at this point, we are familiarizing all these different terms and uh, components and we are moving forward. That is why I have that little picture saying, we, uh, th this, this is only for the awareness, the interest, and you know, I'd, I'd say, you know, to, to attain our focus and objective of decision-making and sometimes for an action. So about the design and optical path in spectra, spectral device or spectrometer. If you happen to talk to an astronomer about, you know, astronomers use spectrometer. Actually, this was invented. This spectral device was invented for astronomy. We borrowed it, started commercializing it for to the chemical analysis area. Or uh, now it is used heavily in the medical area, life science area, and so many other areas. So if you speak to with this astronomers or spectrometry specialist, uh, who works on your instrumentation, if you are a user of an instrumentation, they will be speaking on the other side of the phone and say, okay, what about the blue? What about the green? What about the red? And you will be saying, what is this guy talking? These all have its own specific meanings. So these, you know, it is good to know and if anybody is wanted to uh, know more about the different techniques of this, um, like I said, you can call us or you can do a little bit of research study on it. There are different kinds of detection systems uh, available, Rowland Circle, Eschel, poly, polychromy, Polychromator, all that different ways. So in any of these things, it started with, starts with a zero order, then it, it advances to different orders where set wavelengths and different colors are being, you know, are being sectionized. So there is, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the last modules, for lead element itself, there are 205 lines in a small window of 167 nanometer to 780 nanometer. So what is being selected is based on what you are you know, doing in analytical spectrometry. So it, it depends on the sample, the nature of the sample, how the sample system uh, sampling or sample indirectly, indirectly system is working. So we will be seeing those in the interferences about spectral interferences, chemical interferences, physical interferences. So it is all based on that, how you fine tune the analytical spectrometric process, which is called method. And we will come into it as we move on. So the spectral device, the spectrometers and the ge geometric optics has some components and let us stay with it uh, to familiarize. And uh, as we move on to know what is, why, why it is so important. It starts with the spec sample introductory system, then we call it pre-optics. Before, you know, there will be some optic system before the main engine of optics to collect and collimate and focus the light from that, that, that plasma source or atomizer. Many different angles of, in ICP, for example, axial, radial, and simultaneous, or you know, both together, dual uh, simultaneous plasma view are there. In the, that is, that, for that, the optic system will be arranged, and that is what we call it. We sectionize to call the pre-optics. So, on the previous slide, we have seen different ranges of light: blue, red, and green. Those sections. So, the pre-optics should be capable of transferring all that. The white light coming from the plasma needed to be using a dispersing element to have the colors dif differentiated then it needed to be sent over to an engine. For example, if it is a polychromator, 
that polychromator engine takes the light from the pre-optics and then again it further separates into wavelengths. Those who are working on inductively coupled plasma spectrometric analysis, polychromator SL for configuration, SL E C H E L L E, SL polychromator has become you know the common or those who are working in laser based, based plasma, laser induced plasma spectroscopy. Uh, SL polychromator is being used. So this, this different detection system, for example, a polychromator is used. Uh, the pre-optics sends, you know, collects, gathers the data, the, the spectral light and sends it over to this engine, which has components. And it needed to be maintained in certain conditions. And it can be used with the different detectors. So based on the detector that you needed to have certain things taken care of. Normally, for you know, for, uh, normally, the pre-optics windows and the optical surface that is being used in the main engine should be capable of handling superior UV performance. So there are certain materials needed to be used for that purpose, magnesium fluoride, calcium fluoride, all those details you can look at on that. On the grading, the surface coating of aluminum and overcoated with the magnesium fluoride is needed for you know, some those, those wavelengths, we call it spectral bandwidth coverage. So polychromator needed to be thermally stabilized. If it is used with an ICP, that, that ICP inductivity coupled to plasma torch generates so much of heat. So there will be a chiller and a cooling happening. And when the cooling happening using the water and uh, that comes into those polychromator there for the to thermally stabilize. So the condensation needed to be avoided. Those, those things needed, you know, so these all, this is all part of the user and that is why I'm explaining. So this thermally stabilization of 30 degrees, 35 degrees C or 40 degrees C, depending on the design of the instrument, needed to be done you know, very carefully so that some of this unwanted, unwanted thing you know, should happen as you utilize or operate the instrument. This polychromator, I, you know, the, 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 this is two different, uh, you could see my mouse, right? You could, uh, movement. You could see two different engines of detection here. One is a Rowland circle, which is to the right. I picked that, the, the, this is a picture that I designed a long time back, uh, which you are familiar if you have seen, um, uh, seen some, uh, some of the areas, the you know, Rowland circle. This is optical components as a spectral device. See, you know, all these are, are arranged and configured in a circle format. That is why it's called Rowland circle. And within the Rowland circle, there are different configuration called the literal, uh, pass and runge, all that. Uh, we are not going into so much of detail there. Yeah, but if, you know, if one is interested, uh, get back to us, we will be able to explain you what is what. The polychromator, is a different de design the way that you can see. It is like a box. You will get to see one of the uh, picture of it soon. But I, I have this exploded view here. See, as I explained, the pre-optics collects the light, brings it over here to the entrance, okay? To the, through here, to the entrance slit, lets it in, collimated, Collimating mirror will bounce it. See here, it is white light. And as soon as it hits the, this, the dispersing surface, which is a grating here, then it becomes spectral light. Then it goes, you know, some, some designs on a shell polychromator, we use a focus mirror. Then the focus mirror will be used to focus it for its optimized light capture on the detector, on the camera. Nowadays, the linear detectors, charge a couple of the device, CCD, CMOS are becoming very common or very popular in use. So that is what we call it camera. So if you are using an iPhone or a digital camera, it is the same chip that is, is used inside there 
that can use in this spectral device as well. So it is very simple. Uh, you know, it is not even complicated as your smartphone is. So very, very simple. See it very simply uh, and uh, see how this is being laid out, the Explorer view of a polychromator. This is how this polychromator will see after it is, you know, you are not allowed to go in uh, inside to, you know, don't get too excited about hearing this expert level, expert stream components uh, name and uh, the way that it looks and all that and go into your instrument and open up a polychromator or an optical system, which might be maintained under uh, vacuum or anything like that. Don't do that. If you touch a grading with your bare finger, that's it. It's, it's gone. So there are some precautions needed to be taken, how you uh, go inside that chamber and how you work on it. And uh, so please don't get too excited about what you hear here and go and open it up without proper consultation or preparations. But I wanted you to learn this. Um, many did not, don't have this kind of information and this kind of uh, aware or this kind of, um, information available who does this kind of uh, you know teaching so you need it you get to see the inside uh, components the way it is and how it has been um, aligned up and this is very precisely aligned optical components so if you uh, have that is why we provide all this alignment, <laughs> alignment uh, uh, tools and uh, uh, and gadgets where that optical components are mounted. It is not just glued with a five minute epoxy or not. No, nowadays there will be a mechanism where you can shift different X, Y, Z angles so that you can align it for the optimal, the best uh, function, best, best productivity of that, in, uh, of that component for its intended use. So here on this polychromator, the there will be a shutter for this, you know, entrance slit. So it will be coming in, uh, you know, bouncing from a pilot mirror, then going to the collimator. So remember, this is up to, up to here, it is white light. Then it goes into the grading, okay, prism and grading right here. It's a combination on this particular one. Uh, then it will be going on to the focus mirror, then to the detector, and we have it under a, you know, this is kept under certain conditions. So why I said all this is to for you to familiarize how a spectrometer or spectrometric analysis system functions. So that ends our module two. Any questions you can ask. Um, different, there are a lot of other different kinds of um, uh, spectral devices um, called the Zerny Turner, Fabric, a lot of, lot of different names are there. So, um, uh, you know, all, all of them has its own merits and demerits, its own, uh, you know, strength, weakness, uh, its own advantage, disadvantage, limitations. Uh, that is why different different configurations are there and that is what that is my that is the job security of a person like me we consult with the the people who are planning to procure a system for their spectrometric analysis we consult you know we do technical con, you know consultation and we we work together with that per, you know that team uh, what exact solution? This is not an instrument. This is a solution for their analytical need, analytical analytical wants. So, uh, how best we can configure what spectral device and what all modification needed to be done, what all different different uh, coatings and you know and reflective surfaces needed to be there, uh, taking consideration of uh, performance and uh, lifespan and all those. So uh, that is why you really needed to know about what is inside there, how that functions and uh, uh, this little section of 
spectrometric analysis. Okay, uh, as our time is limited, I'm not going to take time to give a break here. Um, I only have 20 more minutes and uh, actually I have two more modules. So let me, let me go uh, move on to the next module. Okay, atomic spectrometry is a very popular, the most commonly used spec analytical spectrometric method. Within the atomic spectroscopy, I came to this slide to show you how that has been branched out. It has so many branches. I mentioned about atomic absorption, AAS, atomic emission, AES, within the atomic emission, inductively coupled to plasma, spark, two of those are being mentioned already. So you got that picture of different spectrometric method. This atomic spectrometric methods, as I said, the difference between absorb atomic absorption and atomic emission is where the sample is, is being positioned and what kind of calculation that we are making out of it. One is the calculation based on the absorption of spectral light by the sample in a curve. The other one is the sample introductory system is designed in a way that the sample is, is introduced so that the spectral light can be, you know, the light, the sample will be the first, like, like you see here, sample will be first, the light will be afterwards, then you get the detection system. Ionization is also the same way. So atomic absorption spectrometry, atomic emission spectrometry, atomic mass spectrometry, atomic ionization spectrometry, atomic luminescence spectrometry, atomic fluorescence, phosphorescence, light scattering, and refractometry. There are so many different more technical methods or spectrometric methods. Everything has its own strength and at the same time, it has its own limitation. That is why we have instruments of multiple spectrometric methods in a lab. Let us see this variance as we move forward. Atomic absorption is, is, you know, is used for certain areas where it has its strength. We will be looking at those as well, how, how we pick that and based on what and all that. See for here, uh, if it is only few samples uh, and a few elements, uh, then uh, atomic at, uh, absorption spectrometry is a good choice for you. And within the atomic absorption spectrometry, there is furnace, graphite furnace. In within the furnace, atomizer, atomic emission spectrometry. That is what this is, FAAS. Within the furnace atomizer, there is a graphite furnace atomizer. That is what it is called, the GFAAS. So there are so many different configurations within these techniques. As we move on, we will be learning some of some of those, and uh, then I will conclude with the end of it, like the calculation methods, mathematical statistics, and we will call it done. Okay, let's move on. The instrument or the spectrometric methods or variants, atomic absorption. As I mentioned, the graphite furnace, atomic emission spectroscopy, you know, uh, atomic absorption, there is atomic emission graphite furnace or ETV, uh, ETA, which is electrothermal atomizer in atomic emission and atomic absorption, uh, which will be that, 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 you know, that sample will be processed inside a furnace for that to be cleansed to remove the chemical interferences. So we will be looking into the interferences like what is chemical interference, what is physical interferences, what is spectral interference. So 
for all these has its own reason and function why this is designed this way. So the graphite furnace AAS, electrothermal atomizer ETA AAS, then we have intercavity laser spectrometry, which falls into the absorption calculation. So that is AAS technique. Then we have cavity ring down spectrometry, which is CRDS, which falls into the Beer's law calculation and AAS uh, family. So this AAS, it has its own characteristics. You could see the periodic chart here for all the elements. The, the metals in solution is the most uh, common area of use on atomic absorption. It can go from PPB to a higher concentration level sample handling. It can go up to 67 elements. More, you know, some of them are sequential with the monochromator. So it will take time. If you have 67 elements, one after the other using a monochromator, if you are doing 67 elements, 67 times, uh, you know, like analysis, so it will be a time consuming thing. So that is one of the limitation that we have about this atomic absorption. To get what we want, we may have to use a photomultiplier tube based monochromator and then it will be, the analysis time will be much longer. But with this, some of these techniques, uh, some of this sample type, uh, this is one of the most desired, preferred technique. So sample preparation is needed in most of the case, like acid digestion. And, uh, you know, the, the sample, when you, you know, I, I divide the sample uh, introductory system like this. There is a sample making, there is a sample prep, there is a sa sample sampling process. As I, I got involved with so many different techniques. Um, the sample making is how to make a sample so that you can do spectrometric analysis. For example, one time I've been challenged by one of my customer at their at my customer site in Texaco, Enron Research Center. They gave me a, uh, some grease that they have received from a oil well in Africa to know the wear and tear of the oil rig there in Africa that the grease has been taken out of that oil rig. And I had a optical emission spectrometer, which is ArcSpark spectrometer, which where they you know, only solid sample can be analyzed. This cannot be used the way it is to a arc spark spectrometer. So I had to do a sample making. What did I do? I burned that grease into ashes, mixed it with the copper powder, put it in a pellet press, made it like a coin, like a pellet, then mounted it on and put it onto a arc spark spectrometer. If you ask all these spark spectrometer people, can they do grease on their instrument to know wear and tear happened or not? They will say, no, 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 no. Our spectrometer will handle only solid samples. If you apply sample making step, then you will be able to do it. Anyway, that is a side note. Sky is the limit when you put your, uh, your thinking, your, your abilities, uh, to, to, to know, to learn, or to figure out certain things. So this sample making, sample prep, sample processing, all those are very important in analytical spectrometry. And if you don't do that properly, then you will be compromising your precision, accuracy, all these quality, quality factors of your data or your result. So atomic absorption has its salient features and you know favorable characteristics for certain usage, but not all of them. That is not one word solution. That is why we need others. Okay. So the questions that we needed to ask to determine what instrument do I need based on this atomic spectrometry. 
how many samples or elements do I need to do? So that is what I mentioned in the beginning of the first module about needs and wants, analytical needs and wants. So you needed to zoom, zoom into your analytical needs and wants, then you pick the right choice or the preferred techniques of spectrometric method, okay? The detection limit that you want. And as we come on uh, forward about the different techniques, we will be you know, using, uh, this is very important about detection limit, LOD, limits of detection and LOQ, limits of quantitation. So based on that, we will be able to pick whether it is AAS that you need or AES or uh, atomic mass spectrometry that you need or, uh, you know, or any of those things, okay? And also, uh, we all live in this world where money is the mode of transaction and the budget becomes an issue. Um, that is another thing. Operating budget, purchase cost, overall requirements, sample types, usage, all these are the other questions that you need to ask yourself as you prepare yourself of making, or making a selection of what technique is most appropriate for you. This, you all, you know, this is another uh, a slide for you to know what is the difference between an atomic absorption and an emission. See, the source, the polychromatic light is coming, hitting to and going through the samples and the sample absorbs it. And that is what AAS is. But here it is different. Sample, polychromatic light is coming from the sample. In emission, atomic emission spectrometry, the, the sample is what gives us the polychromatic light and it hits onto the spectral device and the detection will be reading it. If the detection is a photomultiplier tube or a CCD camera, then we call two different you know, names and things like that. So there are multiple different de detectors available there. Other detectors are PDA, uh, all, all different uh, detectors are there. Let's move on with the different types of atomic emission spectroscopy or atomic emission spectrometry. ARC AES, SPARC AES. The ARC and SPARC are two different things. Don't get me wrong. It is two different things. Okay. Uh, there are arc spark, both combined together instruments, but uh, it is two different techniques in atomic emission. Then there is gas discharge, uh, like a glow discharge atomic emission. Then we have the plasma, you know, all these makes plasma, okay? All this atomic emission uh, that I have listed here, but when you apply the excitation energy, spark makes a plasma, gas discharge, glow discharge makes a plasma, inductively coupled plasma makes a plasma, laser induced also makes a plasma. And from the, pla you know, from the plasma only, we will be getting the, the light. And the markets are chemical and energy, environmental, food, materials, forensic and drug, life sciences, it goes on like that. Okay, there are much more. I just listed a few. What is the difference? How is it different between these techniques that I just mentioned in the previous slide? Arc, spark, glass, gas discharge, ICP, LIPS, laser-induced plasma, laser ablation, ICP, all this. What is different? Spark AES or arc spark AES, there is an electrode. HEPS, high energy pre-spark, is being applied through this electrode in an inert gas environment to the sample surface. See the sample here? And this indentation or this happens through the, you know, we the common inert gas used is argon. So the argon hits onto the surface, ionization happens, plasma formation happens, then the spectral light is being emitted. Same way, gas discharge, we could see there is a GD lamp here where the sample is mounted. There will be an anode. 
and there will be argon plasma coming, making some, something very similar to this. And that optic system will be capturing the light from there, from there, and sending it over to the spectral device to the detection. Okay. So the atomizer is what these different techniques differs. If you wanted to design an, 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 an instrument which with the same, see from here onwards, from this little section onwards, this detection and op, we call it optics or spectrometer, spectrograph or polychromator or monochromator, whatever you use. So this optic system can be seen in any atomic emission, any atomic emission. You can use the same, of course, one technique prefers one design of an optic system, but it is possible to use one optic system for all this. So the only difference is my, my the, the area that I wanted to emphasize is the only dif the difference is in the atomizer the plasma formation area. Here it is electrode. Here it is an anode to sample. Here it is a torch. And in laser it will be a laser will be coming from the side or, or from the top and the laser rays will be hitting onto the surface of the sample or to the side, you know, wherever uh, you will be hitting it. So it is the atomizer which makes the difference. Let us see what's, how Spark looks like. The Spark AES, as I explained, this is where the sample is mounted. This is the optic system. See here, electrode, sam you know, sample, there will be a little holder. The sample is holding there, which will be a spring-loaded one. And where we will be applying the high excitation energy. See, and this light path, there is a little window here. Entrance, you know, this window is, uh, this window is the optics to to send the light, the white light through the entrance slit to the dispersing medium, which is the grating and the detectors are aligned in its position and the readout electronics. That is what is inside a spark atomic emission spectrometer. Okay. So this uh, spark AES is very, very popular. It is used in foundries, metal making, automotive industry, aerospace, iron and steel industry, yeah, you go to any steel or metal making area, you know, foundries or uh, uh, metal handling, material science uh, places, one of this will be there of different scale like scales. The defense sector, electronic industry, R&D, academia, universities, although they, are, they all use this. Glow discharge or gas discharge, optical emission spectrometer. Again, the atomizer is the only difference. It can use, it can be combined with the same optics if you want to. If you take the optic system from Spark and put it on a glow discharge atomizer, it becomes an atom, a glow discharge emission spectrometer. So here it is, instead of an electrode, it is an anode sample here. An argon comes in and sputters into. This gas discharge, the glow discharge has a salient feature that when it sputters in, it is like a, PVD and CVD or the layer uh, formation or uh, deposition kind of a sputtering happening. Like, uh, you know, like PVD, physical vapor deposition, CVD, chemical vapor deposition. It's the same thing is happening. Gas discharge is happening and sputtering is happening. So it evenly removes the material. So spark can, you know, spark sputters in but it is blasting. Glow discharge is atomizer is that it can go very evenly onto the sample. So because of that, it can do layer analysis to the nanoscale and all those. So that is one of the major advantage of this uh, techniques. 
So, you know, the glow discharge plasma generation, you know, is very, uh, very simple, uh, very simple uh, with the help of argon, just like the other techniques. And it can be used for multiple usage. Um, it can be used for qualitative and quantitative analysis. Depending on your detector that you are using, you can you can do all those uh, materials. And this glow discharge, you know, this is this spark OES can do only the solid material and the conductive material. This ga gas discharge can happen. This uh, chemical uh, vapor deposition, physical vapor deposition is happening in semiconductor industry and all lot of these coding techniques. So they are advancing, progressing like anything. So non-conductive like a glass, a ceramics, on uh, like all those materials uses RF-based atomizer. And um, wow, I'm running out of time. Okay, let me complete this uh, in a few minutes. So this um, uh, th this technique can be used for uh, ma many diverse materials, uh, metals, semiconductors, glass, ceramics, polymers, uh, and paint. Uh, I installed a mini unit in uh, the here in US for uh, aircraft industry to to uh, and all lot of different uh, uh, techniques where they they wanted to know layer by layer uh, analysis uh, of materials and uh, and things so these are the industries that they use it um, you can uh, if you anybody wanted to know more information about it let me know um, and we will we will be able to help you all ICPA, yes, is the next technique, inductively coupled to plasma. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Purushottaman is very knowledgeable in this area, so you can ask um, her as well. The normal analytical zone is, you know, this, this, is, a, this is going to be a uh, RF coil where we will be bringing the power, power onto the coil, um, Tesla coil, we call it, and then you can have the emission, it, a plasma will be formed and a stream uh, from a stream of liquid sprayed using a uh, chamber, which will be using a nebulizer, which will be nebuli you know, happening the nebulization. So uh, we will, we will, we will get to, you know, I think I have a slide that I put in somewhere to show you the full, full uh, right here. The sample, there will be a peristaltic pump, which will be pumping the sample onto a nebulizer. The nebulizer is, uh, is a little device with the help of a pressure or from the side, it has a nozzle to spray into the sample, you know, the, the sample aerosol will be given to the spray chamber. The spray chamber will be feeding with the positive pressure again. And if, you know, that's, that we will be, you know, feeding the sample onto here so there will be a power supply connecting to this uh, coil that I, induction coil that I mentioned, which this is this part is called the torch plasma torch. So this plasma or a flame will be obtained from this sample. Sample a proper introductory system is a must for it. So the you know if you don't have a proper introductory system you don't have a proper signal. If you don't have a proper signal, you don't have a proper result. It doesn't matter how good your detection system is. So the emitted light will be put onto the detection system and you will get the information. So that is how that works, plasma. Okay, nebulization, dissolvation, vaporization, atomization and ionization, then the emission. Okay, I thought of going little detailed into it, but uh, you know, time is limited. So let us let me let me glance through with the some of the key uh, slides here. The liquid sample, as I said, is sprayed into the superheated plasma, and it is being measured for quantification. So for quantification, you need an engine of calculation. Okay, so. You are now you have an idea of atomic emission. The optic system is same. The atomizer is different, and uh, then you need a quantification system based on what you are pushing into the sample. What sample you are pushing into, 
and how. So that is what we call calibration, calibration building, method development, okay? How you develop a method for what sample and what all techniques, that is of interest here as well. Based on, uh, now we have covered a different atomizer and these are different, different atomizers. Okay, flame AA, graphite furnace AA, microwave plasma AES, ICP OES, ICP EMS, all those, they're different, different, you know, levels of detections, different sample throughput. These all are based, based on these only we pick which one is needed, okay? Of course, ease of use, cost, all those are there as well. Interferences, spectral interferences, physical interferences, chemical interferences. There are three different interferences. Spectral interferences is that there are spectral light which will be interfering with the spectral wavelength or fingerprint or identifier that you wanted to, to use for to calculate the value for a particular element of interest for you. So when that happens, then you need to address that, okay? Physical interferences is when you are putting the sample in and if you are putting not just the sample, you are putting something else into it, then that physically those two or multiple things combined will interfere each other. Chemical interferences is that things which are combined together has similar chemical nature and it will interfere each other or chemical reaction can, you know, based on the chemical reaction, some, what happens by, you know, a product happens, a byproduct happens. So those are the chemical interferences. So these are being addressed by the, and by the strategies which is for the spectral and background interferences, we use IEC inter-element correction, background correction, spectral interference cor correction, and avoidance. Strategies to manage physical and chemical interferences is there is a technique called internal standard, which is if the sample that you are pumping in has more than one item, then you will be having one internal standard with only one item. So you will be having something which you will be bringing in to make a calculation so that you can make comparison and calculation together using your computation engineering. Metrics matching, method of standard addi additions and ionization buffer are the techniques. This is the, the slide for me to explain you about the interferences. Now, as we move on, based on the detector, the, based on the atomizer, different techniques are there. Based on the detector also, there are different techniques. If you are using a mass spectrometry, then the same spark OES, if you take that atomizer and made it with a mass spec, actually that is how uh, the ICP MS was birthed. Somebody who had an interest took the atomizer of ICP and he had a mass spec there in his lab. He combined it together and then he figured it out. Yeah, with this modification, I can make an ICP MS. So all these techniques, atomizers can be mated with mass spec. So, and uh, when, you know, the, the, the good, you know, one will be asking, where do I, how do I dis decide which one I need? Even if you have more money to buy an MS system, enough money to buy an MS system, you still wanted a higher concentration of samples to be analyzed. MS is not the best fit. You need an OES. If you wanted to go, if even if you don't have enough money to buy an MS, and if you wanted to go to the trace level, ultra trace level of concentration range, like a PPB, PPT level, you really needed to buy an MS detection system. So that is, those are the scenarios that you, you bring into consideration of deciding whether you need a Spark MS or Glow Discharge MS or ICP MS or Laser Ablation MS, you know, that mass spec is needed or not. So same atomizer can be used for the mass spec with some modification and then it becomes 
that technique, that spectroscopic spectrometric technique, okay? Analytical chemistry in pharmaceutical labs needed to follow certain, you know, procedures. This professional professionals who are involved in this spectro uh, analytical spectrometry in a regulated industry needed to follow certain path and steps. The requirements and common topics for today's pharmaceutical industry, like in, here in the US, we have something called CFR, Code for Regulation, CFR Compliance. So then uh, there, is a, there are certain things, you know, like um, uh, somebody mentioned about American Chemical Society. If you are in the material science world, ASTM, ACS, all those has their own procedures and standards written up already for certain things that you needed to follow for certain areas. So these regulatory environment, pharmaceutical biopharma labs, when you are involved with the analytical spectrometry, you needed to cert do certain things, okay? Follow certain procedures. And these regulations are largely consistent across the board. For example, if you know how to pro properly pro follow good laboratory practices, GLP, under FDA, then you can quickly pick up and transition over to the GLP for the EPA, okay? It is very common. And so this analytical spectrometry is, is connected each other for you to know and how to transition over, how to use the same thing for different regulatory environment. Material science, as I mentioned, ASTM, ACS, ISO, all those. Um, so analytical spectrometry, as we conclude, what is in the box? You need sample introduction or input, atomizer, signal collection, and processing to read out, OK? If it is qualitative analysis that you need, this is all you need. If you want a quantitative analysis, then you needed to have a quantitative engine, which is which leads to you to method development. So for the method development, you needed to ask a certain questions, you needed to prepare yourself, you needed to line up certified reference material, reference materials, in-house standards, all those uh, needed to be built, you know, then you needed to add certain things into the standards library for the library hit, all those. Whether it is you are using a GC, you know, I, I you know, there are uh, certain things that I mentioned about, our, you know, here, different techniques. Um, there is something called hyphenated in the, this last one, hyphenated. Hyphenated is that you mix and match or mix, club things together. Like for example, if you have a, you know, he mentioned that you have a gas chromatograph in the engineering college there. You can hyphenate it, that gas chromatograph or analytical spectrometry based on your needs and wants. I got involved with multi-dimensional gas chromatography, GC by GC, uh, LC, 2D LC. The HPLC can be upgraded to for two-dimensional liquid chromatography. So the GC, how can I, how can you make a GC by GC? Like how can you do the speciation or uh, hyphenation? You put a secondary, you know, secondary column and a secondary oven inside the main oven, and you modulate. If it is thermal modulation or flow modulation, based on that modulation, you put in the modulator. Then you will be collecting two-dimensional data. That is where the multi-dimensional chromatography happens. Then you can mate it with whatever detection system you wanted. AED is atomic emission detector. Mass spec, you can do a quadrupole. Uh, you can use a time of flight mass spec. You can use, you know, there are, depending on what you're trying to do, you can mate it with the detection system. And then you do the quantification based on that. We are heavily involved with the metabolism and breath analysis and breath biopsy with these techniques, even in the life science and and um, uh, medical treatment areas. The same instrument that you are handling for material science or chemical. Can you all hear me? 
Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. There was one disturbance, and I am <laughs> by mistake I muted you. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So sir. you you will be able to combine club it together and combine it together and hyphenate the system. So analytical spectrometry is such a vast area, diverse area. Uh, based on your analytical need, your want, you can hyphenate it, you can, uh, speciation can be happen, you can club it with the different techniques, and this is, can be used as a very powerful technique for your uh, use, for your, your section. So whatever your section is, you know, whatever your areas of interest is, let it let it um, let you go into that area and uh, utilize it i see a spectral horizon a promising future for you all i wish you the best with this webinar whatever you have gathered the objectives that you have, you have accomplished the awakening architecture inside the analytical spectrometry success and future the twins uh, are there when you put yourself into it explore the field uh, be purposeful, thoughtful, transformational, of course, not least, but lastly, result-oriented. And may God bless you all uh, for you to accomplish what you needed to accomplish. And, uh, and that concludes this webinar from my side. Thank you, sir. Now it's open for questions. Anybody can ask any queries? So I have a simple doubt, sir. I would like to get it clarified. Is there any real difference between ICP AES and OES? Sir? No, there is no none. Detector? ICP AES and ICP OES, it's both the same. Um, it's it's two different, you know, wording is being used. Optical emission spectrometry and atomic and, emission uh, spectrometry. Yeah. Are Even the <laughs> detector does not differ, sir. No. Well, the you know the name. In your first part of the question is ICP AES and ICP OES the same? Yes. But when it when we get into the detector of different detectors, um, the researchers and the scientific community, even the manufacturers, then they do a hyphenation. Okay, they can put uh, that abbreviation to the name. That's all. But Detection is some, you know, the, you know, is uh, is differing based on what is the best for that intended application. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Is there any advantage uh, of uh, Roland circle over other monochromatics, sir? It depends. In certain areas, you really need, you know, the Roland circle is the best. Uh, but it is limited in some areas. For example, um, I'm sorry, sir. Can you hear me? Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Some uh, disturbance. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, sir. I'm able to okay. hear. Yeah, uh, Rowland Circle, you know, had its advantage during uh, for the PMT, for a multiplier tube design. With a one meter or uh, 750 mm uh, focal length at Rowland Circle, we were getting, see, on that we were, we were physically uh, doing a little bit of separation on the wavelengths with using an exit slit okay so white light comes in hits on the grating then that dispersed light we were sending it through an exit slit with the use of uh, linear detectors ccds and cmos now it is slitless exit slitless uh, design of Roland circle so that 
uh, you know, uh, physical or getting more in, you know, more uh, like dedicated, uh, the more space, physical space to mound, uh, mound all those, you know, photomultiplier tubes, detectors, that advantage is, is pretty much uh, limited now with the, the, you know, the popular use or the common use of uh, linear detectors. So, it all depends. Um, I don't, you know, there are manufacturers who say that Roland circle is, is the best. Uh, there are manufacturers who say, <laughs> uh, no, uh, ours is the best. So um, they all have their own little way of accomplishing. Uh, for example, ICP. ICP has a different approach than an arc spark or a glow discharge atomic emission or LIPS. Uh, LIPS and ICP has similar approach. The approach difference is on a spark spectrometer, the elements and its wavelengths are selected, selective, and they pre-calibrate uh, the instrument in the factory for the customer need. For example, um, if an instrument is sold for Ashok Leyland there in, in your, 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 or um, one of the co company there, they will be sending an uh, analytical program to the ArcSpark, uh, ArcSpark manufacturer or glow discharge manufacturer. On ICP, that is not the case. You will be pumping in any solution. So you needed to have a detection engine to uh, open for any wavelength to be selected and any elements that which, which it can handle to be selected, uh, you know, like a pick and choose of method development, okay? So that is where this uh, detection engine capability, uh, you know, significance happens. Thank you very much, sir. Can sure. we invite any questions or we can end up the session, sure. sir? Sure, sure. Because you're running no. short of time, I think. You have another session. Yeah, sir. yeah. Uh, we have nine more minutes that you, uh, you said that we can go okay. and take this. Okay. To no, course. I don't have any issues sir, from my <laughs> side. I'm asking you because you have another speech, you said. Yes, I, I do have another speaking engagement at 10.30 of my, my time. So it's 9.51 now. Is there any questions from the audience? Either they learned it well, or they did not learn anything at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> hmm. Okay, Nishant, I think if there are no questions, we can end the session. All okay, right. ma'am. So thank you, sir. The session was really so interesting and informative. And now I request Dr. Revati Purushottaman, ma'am, to propose the vote of thanks. My heartfelt thanks to the speaker, Ben Johns, for accepting the invitation besides this busy schedule, especially on a weekend Saturday. Thank you very much, sir. As an academician, we have our own way of learning with limitations, but this talk was an eye-opener for all of us to explore more on analytical spectroscopy. Thanks for sharing your magnificent expertise with us today. I thank our management and Honorable Vice-Chancellor for their encouragement and constant support in organizing various events. My special thanks to our beloved registrar for his involvement and enthusiastic participation in all events. I would like to thank our school dean, Dr. S. Kutirani, and our HOD, Dr. D. Ishwaramurthy, for their pers persistent motivation, which makes us work round the clock. I am grateful to all the participants from all over India and participants from other parts of the world, which include UK, USA, Spain, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan, and even Turkey, without whom this program would not have been possible. My special thanks to all the faculty, research scholars, and students of our department and other departments of the university who support me in all my activities. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, thank, you. Evening, sir. Uh, Morning. thank you. Thank you very much.
for your elaborative and informative talks thank you thank you sir bye now i request all the participants to stay online and please follow up our coordinators instruction thank you very much sir all the participants will be uh, sending the feedback link in both youtube chat box as well as uh, the chat box over zoom you can fill the feedback it's mandatory for you to get the certificate and you'll be uh, you'll have to wait for another one or two days to receive the certificate all are requested to fill the certificate i mean a uh, feedback form please it's there Thank in both you. youtube as well as uh, in the zoom chat box Th thank you one and all for attending it did you enjoy and i expected more questions nobody asked any question ah he has already mentioned na either they would understand either they would understand <laughs> i think we should take the other side yes, am i correct sir yes yes absolutely mm. okay thank you dr revathi for arranging a wonderful for you on yeah holidays most welcome sir thank you sir thank you thank you thank you nisha nisha khadija